It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Smooth and Savvy is joined by some of the hottest talent in the entertainment industry. From musicians to authors and all those in between. Along with our own Periscope girl. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here he is, Mr. Smooth and Savvy himself, Douglas Coleman. Ho, 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 he, 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 ha, ha. Welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show. It's me, Douglas Coleman. How are you? How are you? Another great show on tap for you today, a full interview with author Nicole Delacroix, who wrote the book called Sexual Confessional. So we don't have a lot of time to chit-chat. We're just going to have to get right to the show. But I did want to say one thing. Uh, coming up in March, I'm going to have a guest on named Michael Temez, who is an author of a nutrition book. And more importantly, he went through an experience that I'm sort of going through at the moment, and that is a battle with weight problem, with weight gain, actually. And I have to lose 50 pounds, which is probably not the easiest thing to do, but it can be done with some discipline, diet, and exercise. Michael actually lost 100 pounds, which was incredible. And he is going to be on later in March and tell us his story. So I'm going to just tell you that so far I've lost 8 pounds on this diet and hopefully got 42 more to go. So we'll see. I'll keep you updated on the shows and let you know how my progress is. And when I get down to a weight that I'm happy with, I'll take some pictures and put them up on Facebook. And we'll do the old before and afters because I've got Michael's before and after pictures and they're really quite, uh, quite incredible. Looks like a different person altogether. So anyways, that's that. I know a lot of people struggle with the weight problem, especially in America. We seem to be the fattest country on the planet. A lot of it just has to do with the, you know, a lifestyle change. It's uh, some of the foods that we eat aren't the healthiest foods for us. I know I'm guilty of eating at McDonald's probably once too many times. And uh, you just have to make those kind of changes, especially when you get older and your body starts slowing down. It, uh, it's got to be, you know, people that are morbidly obese don't tend to live very long. And I would like to live to a ripe old age anyways, as long as I can and as long as I'm healthy. So I'm going to do this diet. Hopefully by the end of the year, I will have the weight off. I don't want to lose it too fast because it tends to come right back on if you lose it real quickly. So losing it slow and steady is probably the best way to do it. I will keep you posted. We will be right back with Nicole Delacroix after these commercial messages. Bondi Guest House in Jomtien Beach, Patil, Thailand. And their guest house offers beachfront accommodations with all rooms having sea views. Some rooms have balconies overlooking the sea as well. The Jomtien nightlife is within an easy stroll and the beach is right outside your door. The attractions of Pattaya City nightlife are also just a few minutes ride away. Food is available 24 hours and offer a selection of European and Thai food. The owners, Colin and Malcolm, look forward to welcoming you to the Bondi. For more information, email Colin at Bondi Pattaya, B-O-N-D-I-P-A-T-T-A-Y-A, at yahoo.co.uk. And if you do contact them, please mention that you heard about it on Douglas Coleman's show. With Adventure Boundless, best-selling author Jane Yates follows up her acclaimed Paradox Child trilogy with Garden, a steampunk science fiction novel with fantasy overtones, enjoyable for all ages. Inspired by the classic novel The Secret Garden, Garden begins with 11-year-old Aberdeen living in space above a perilous Earth. Aberdeen is looked after by her robot nanny, but she is often used to being alone, dreaming of dragons and castles. The sudden death of her parents forces her to live with her neglectful uncle on Earth and is captivated to find a world repairing itself. Fascinated by her new surroundings, Aberdeen makes new friends and explores the boarded-up house, only to discover a mysterious tunnel leading to wondrous things. Follow Aberdeen's journey of self-discovery, of trials and friendship. Garden narrated by acclaimed actress Anna Parker-Naples. 
Hi there, this is Stuart Epps from the UK, record producer, engineer. Uh, you might have heard of me. I've worked with artists from Elton John to Led Zeppelin to uh, Bad Company, Twisted Sister, Robbie Williams, Oasis, many, many great bands and artists in the past and in the present and uh, hopefully in the future. But uh, you can work with me as well. You know, all you got to do is get in touch with me on epsmusicproductions.com. That's uh, E-double-P-S productionsmusic.com. Uh, and I can help you with your productions and with your recordings. Uh, a lot of people do home recordings now, which you can only take so far. Maybe they need a bit of professional help. So uh, get in touch with me and we can sort it out. And thanks for Douglas Coleman for giving me this spot. Thanks a lot. Cheers, bye. Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Nothing up my sleeve. Presto! <laughs> no doubt about it. I gotta get another hat. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. She is a blogger, author, IT professional, avid tweeter, closet anglophile, and member of the Atlanta Writers Club with addictions to British tea, Doctor Who, and soccer. With a strong will and precocious nature, she is the typical Southern belle, preferring science and reason. Diversity extends to her writing as well, as she writes about anything that strikes her interests. Fiercely loyal to friends and family, she maintains sarcasm is a legitimate art form and challenges conventional thinking. Okay, please welcome my guest, Nicole Delacroix. Hello, Nicole. How are you? Hello, Douglas. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. I saw your uh, ad on Radio guestlist.com, I think it was, and I was very interested in um, having you on the show. I want to ask you first off, you have to tell me a little bit about this uh, book that you just wrote. What inspired this project? Because uh, first of all, I, I'm not even sure what the content is, so you're going to have to get into that a little bit with me. But what was it that inspired you to uh to find out more about people's uh, sexual confessions. It's actually quite the interesting and odd tale, I guess. <laughs> and and I'll give you the quick Reader's Digest version. Okay. Um, if you may not know, but I am a self-published author. And anybody who's published their own art, music, or books knows that you pretty much are on your own. You have to market it yourself. And if you don't have a built-in audience, it can be incredibly soul-crushing. Let's just um, say it was very disappointing. So um, Sexual Confessional is actually my second book. Um, the first book that I put out was actually a sci-fi fantasy young adult um, take on, you know, just an idea that I had been kicking around for a few years and I had put the book together and gotten great cover art and gotten great reviews and had put it out and was immediately disappointed when I was not a millionaire overnight because <laughs> you know that's what we all expect <laughs> it it's, it's funny happen. how that works yeah and, you know, it was really sad because I think the only people who actually bought a copy of my first book was my mom and everybody who's related to me, which in itself should have made me a millionaire. <laughs> but um, apparently a few family members decided they weren't going to pay for it. So <laughs> um, anyways, I my my entire dream was crushed at that moment. And there were some personal things going on in, in my my you know, the job that pays the bills. Right. And I was standing outside and I was thinking to myself, and I, I tend to think out loud. Um, yes, I'm one of those crazy people that you see on the street that talk to themselves. Um, oh, I do I that all the I'm, time. I'm always yeah, talking to myself. I, I think it's yeah. great, you know. Um, and I think I was having a very loud argument with my higher power. Um, and there were a few expletives that were being dropped. And I just started thinking to myself, I'm like, you know, every, there has to be other people in the world that have felt this, you know, this disappointment, this failure, this, you know, whatever it was. So I started thinking to myself, and it was really more of a, a take on trying to make myself feel a little bit better. So I've always been a big Twitter person, Facebook whatever. So I thought, you know, I'm just going to kind of put it out there. A couple of things, you know, just asking people how they feel about disappointments in life and how they deal with them. And I got to talking to my real life friends. And one of my friends, as a joke, 
said, you know, it'd be really, really funny if you put together a bunch of questions like that and got people to respond to it. And I started thinking and I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll ask those big questions that we never seem to ask each other. It's like, why are we here? And do you believe in ghosts and things like that? And then somehow it segued into, I think it'd be a lot more fun to ask people what they think about sex. <laughs> Which, of course, my friends immediately said nobody was going to answer. And I vowed to prove them absolutely wrong, which I did. Um, I put a, an anonymous survey up and posted links in my Twitter, or Facebook, and even engaged some people from Reddit. And within 30 days, I got over 500 people responding to my sex questions, including 253 very brave souls that a answered my optional question of telling me the gory details about their worst sexual experience, <laughs> all of which... I was smart enough when I put it out there because initially I thought maybe one or two people would answer and that would be the end of it and it would be funny and I'd have a good laugh. But being the forward thinker that I am, I had, of course, said that their information may be used for publication. I thought maybe, you know, I'll throw it in there as a story for something later on down the line. With the number of answers I had, I said, why not just make this into a book? Because how much fun is that? And that's kind of where it re it's kind of roundabout, but that's kind of how it came into fruition. Well, this sounds a little similar to what Dr. Kinsey did back in the uh, 30s and 40s, where he did his sex surveys with people and then put out books, one for men and one for women. Yes, and, it, you know, and I've actually read um, Kinsey's book. I'm actually a member of the Kinsey in Institute. Um and I, I follow a lot of his work and um, also the Height Report, which was in the 80s, that did uh, basically the same thing. But theirs was more from a clinical standpoint, I would believe. Mine is more of a really incredibly Scooby-Doo nature. <laughs> Scoo okay. Can you give me an example of one of your questions from the survey? <laughs> Absolutely. In okay. fact, it's my favorite question. Right. Um, it was the one question that was probably the worst one. And by the way, I did answer all the questions myself. And my name is the only one attached to any answers. Everybody else is anonymous. But this was my personal favorite one. Would you rather make your internet browsing history for the past 12 months accessible to anyone or live without the internet in its entirety for a full year? Now you have to stop and think about that. Because internet you think, oh, it's just a web browser. No, that includes text messaging. That includes any data that you used on your phone. It includes if you have um, VoIP phone, because those are all over the internet, so you would never be able to use your phone either. It includes Netflix. It includes Amazon, everything. So you have to stop and think, could you live without that for a full year, or would you rather have people see all the crazy stuff you look up on the internet? Wow. Um, you know what? I think out of security, I think I would go without internet for a year. <laughs> See, now I was in the same boat as you, and I thought the best way to do this, and I did a very unscientific um, experiment on it. Um, of course, living in the South, we have a lot of thunderstorms, and I live in a particular area that the power tends to go out quite often when it's raining. Um so, of course, I waited for the power to go out, and I said, okay, well, let me see how I react to this. You know, a couple of hours without power and internet, I should be fine. You realize very soon that we are completely dependent on our technology. I I felt like I was losing my mind, and it had been hours and hours that I had been without power. It turned out it was about 11 minutes, and I had basically gone to Neanderthal status in my head. <laughs> I was losing my mind. So, I, I, you know, unfortunately for me, while I thought I could live without the Internet, I'm going to have to go with people can see the crazy stuff that I look up on the Internet. And they're just going to have to think I'm a psychopath because, unfortunately, you look at one thing on Wikipedia and then somehow or another you end up on serial killers and you're not sure how you got there. But it, we lead ourselves to one thing to another, and I think that we've become a society that's very dependent upon our technology. And um, I honestly, I can't live without it, and I don't want to. So people are just going to have to think I'm a psychopath. 
Well, I think that there's a valid point to that. And you're also right about the Internet, how... But it's sort of set up like that, where you click from one thing and you end up somewhere completely different than where you started. You know, and everybody's getting a half a penny every time you click on their website. <laughs> um, it's just, it's funny the way the Internet is set up like that. I would only worry about, you know, like I do a lot of Internet banking and things like that. I certainly wouldn't want all that information well, yeah, and exposed of course, you know, to if the this, world. If this really was an experiment, of course, things like internet banking and private information would, of course, remain private. But it would be things like, you know, I, I mean, my personal thing is, is I put, I actually pulled my web usage for a day to put in the book. And it was so much that I literally could only put the things that I did before 11 a.m., because I check my email about 3,000 times a day. Uh, who doesn't? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it was Facebook, Twitter, you know, Gmail. Then it was, you know, onto Wikipedia, and the, the stupid things that we look up during the day. Because, you know, I think we've come to this point in, in society where we're, we just need to know more. And we're so interested in learning other things that we almost have that ADD quality to ourselves where we're looking at one thing and it's like oh this looks interesting let me look at that and we move on to other little things and that's how we kind of move down the road but it was interesting to see what some people said and and, and just so you know most people decided that they that they wanted to just share their internet because they couldn't live without it <laughs> okay well that's that's interesting well let's uh let's talk about sex shall we because that's what uh it seems to be your your book is about one of the questions that I had about this, and, and it was one of the questions that came with your, uh, I keep wanting to call it radio guide list, but it's radio <laughs> guest list. All right. It's a, how has sexual media, social media changed how we view sexual relations? When I read that question, the first thing I thought of was years ago before I got married, I went on some of those online dating sites. You know, back in the day when they were uh, kind of just up and coming. It was always funny to see how people lied on those sites where, you know, they would post a picture of themselves when they were 20 years old and slim and had hair. And and they still do that. <laughs> you know, and, and then when you meet them in person, they're 60 years old and bald or whatever. Um, and I was wondering what you meant by that question or how would what was the question uh the answer to the question that you were going to give i was focusing more on our the youth of today um i i'm in that same boat i'm still single and um i've used internet dating and to be perfectly honest it's still as bad as it was back in its heyday <laughs> um <laughs> i've not had much luck let's leave it at that um, but I think that social media, um, specifically Twitter and Facebook, has really um, distorted the way that young people, and I'm talking people in their 20s and below, view um, relationships, not just friendships and, and sexual relationships, but long-term relationships as well. I mean, they have been completely ensnared by social media. I mean, if you stop and think about it, first of all, the contact is so much easier. I remember when I was younger, if I liked a guy and I wanted to talk to him, I had to build up my courage just to speak to him. I, I'm, I think we can all re relate to the picking up the phone and going, hi, is Johnny there? Oh, sure. <laughs> it, yeah. took, it took courage to do that. And now you don't have to do that anymore because the whole world is knocking on your computer screen. So I, I think that it's that contact is so much easier, but the question becomes is how is that contact better? Because it doesn't seem to have that human connection for me. And I'm wondering if we've desensitized our young people to connections, to those those face to face connections that we remember from our youth and used to be the norm. Um, the second thing is, is private life has become public. Anybody who's been on Instagram or Twitter knows what I'm talking about. Oh, sure. Uh, <laughs> you have you cannot you cannot erase the Internet. And, and I'm speaking from experience because I actually in my in my job that pays the bills, I actually work in IT. 
you cannot erase the internet. And I, I think every one of us has seen these teachers who've done social experiments where they've posted a picture of themselves and asked people to share that around the world just to show kids how fast a picture can travel around the world now. And, um, how many shares it can get, how many likes. And I think most of them, by the time I see them, usually average 100,000, and they've already been around the world twice. Um, and they've only been up for maybe 30 or 40 minutes. So those are lessons to kids, and they think that just because they delete it on Facebook that it gets deleted. That's not the case. You have people, especially predators on the Internet, that are going to download these pictures that you post of yourself naked or in a half-naked state that are saving these to their computer. They never go away. Right. They may use your picture somewhere else on another website. You have no, no control over your own picture. So to me, I don't think that social media has necessarily helped us very much in this in this particular aspect. Yes, they've made connections easier, but the question is, is what are the qualities of those connections? Um, you've got in-person meetings with a virtual, a virtual stranger, which leads to things like cyber stalking. And if you if you're not familiar with the term catfishing, um, which is goes directly to what you were saying about the dating websites is that you've got this picture of someone who is maybe 20 years old, but in real life, they're actually 60. Well, people who catfish have taken this three or four steps further where it might be another guy talking to a guy and he's showing a picture of a very pretty young girl. Well, guy number one thinks he's talking to a very pretty young girl and he's getting to know this person when he's in actuality talking to another man who is really a predator, whether that be sexual, financial, or just cyber stalking. Um, so I think that social media has actually played a huge part in this and that parents especially need to be in tune with the, the latest trends. They need to pay attention to what their kids are doing. They need to pay attention to how their kids are communicating. And they need to sit down and have honest, open discussions that are not judgmental, that are not that dic dictatorial standard that has been the norm for so long. But they need to say, you know what? You need to understand that I'm your parent and I want to protect you. And I want to teach you how to navigate your life where you, a mistake from 20 years ago doesn't come back to haunt you. You know, there's young girls who, you know, gave pictures over the internet or through text or something to a boyfriend, and now all of a sudden their picture's on a porn site. They go to apply for a job, let's say just for the government, and the FBI does a background check, and guess what? They didn't know that their picture was being used on a porn site, but now the FBI has told them this. That is not a good feeling. <laughs> it really isn't. And um, to be perfectly honest, I've actually had that happen to myself where I had, and these were actual picture pictures that an ex-boyfriend took of me, not in a naked state, but just my face. And they got photoshopped onto a porn actress who apparently didn't have the same type of face that I did, but they thought it would be really nice to put my face on her body. And so I found this out from a background check. Um, luckily for me, the site was in another country and I was able to actually get them to take the, the video down um, because they found out that it was not who they thought it was. Um, in that case, I was very lucky. But again, there are people who have probably downloaded that video who think it's me and it's not. <laughs> Did that ever come back to you in the sense that somebody said, hey, I saw you on this website? I mean, <laughs> did, did anybody ever recognize that as your face? Actually, it, actually, interestingly enough, about three years after I got the video to come down, um, a friend of mine, I don't know how he came across it. He was just like, his, and I could tell something was different because he didn't want to ask me straight out. And I was just like, something's going on. What's going on? And he's just like, um, I saw a video with you in it. And I was like, oh, man, not this again. I was like, seriously, it wasn't me, dude. And he's just like, no, 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 I'm telling you, it's 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 you. And I'm like, seriously, did she have a birthmark here? And he's like, no. And I go, then it wasn't me. <laughs> well, thank God for that so, birthmark, huh? 
Yeah, that's pretty much the only thing that saves me is that I can say, <laughs> is this birthmark there? And they go, no. God help me if somebody photoshops that birthmark on there. So that's why I never say what the birthmark is or where it is. So that way nobody can photoshop it on. <laughs> well, you know, you're right about uh, the Internet. And once you post something, it's out there forever. I've run into occasionally on my websites that I use for the show and for my music is there's a lot of sharing going on of people sharing other people's websites and other people's music and, hey, I got a new album out and so that all gets shared, blah, blah, blah. So you get a little bit or I get a little bit careless perhaps what I will share. My attitude is that if somebody posts it on Facebook, it's there to be shared. It's there for the public to see. If you don't want people to see it, don't post it. And I've had people actually email me and send me messages, angry messages, saying, why did you share that? You know, and what was funny about it, I won't mention the name, but <laughs> it was like these most innocuous pictures, like pictures of, you know, the Washington Monument or the Grand Canyon or something like that. It wasn't personal pictures. It wasn't people pictures. These were just like scenery pictures that somebody took. And I actually had them send me an email saying, you know, how dare you, how dare you share those, you know, and I'm Which thinking. Is, a picture like that is easy to get anywhere. So I can understand that they were maybe violated because you used their picture. But again, I agree with you on that, is that if you post it on a public site, which the Internet are all public sites. Right. You you have no you have absolutely no recourse on that. Well, I agree, and I just think that people get a little bit, uh, you know, a, a little misguided on what they think is considered private when they put it out on the internet. If you don't want it to be seen or you don't want it shared, then don't post it. Period. You know, if you want to send this picture that you took of the Grand Canyon to Grandma, email it to Grandma. Don't post it on Facebook and say, here, Grandma, look, you know, thinking that she's going to be the only one who's looking at it because it's insane. And, you know, many people have gotten busted uh, for posting things that probably they shouldn't have posted. But it's funny how far people will take it, you know, where they think that their Facebook page is their own little private world that only select people can look at. You can set the privacy settings to a certain point but eh, you know keep keep it off the internet if if the grand canyon is really a private picture for you <laughs> <laughs> well and and that's that is a great rule of thumb and i think I, my rule of thumb is is that i have i have my professional life as my writing career and i have my page on facebook and i have my privacy settings set so that people can post whatever they like or say whatever they like on my page however anything that they post has to be moderated and if i don't like what they say i don't let it go on my page right and you can do that but my my rule of thumb is is that if you have more than one friend on your facebook assume that anything that you post is now public exactly Exactly because true. once you post that picture, and if if you ever stop and actually read the terms of Facebook and Twitter, they will tell you that once you post it, you have given up all rights to it. <laughs> yeah, it becomes their property, essentially. Exactly. And they give people, once you sign up for an account with Facebook, you have the right to use anybody else's pictures. So anything you post is really, it becomes their property and you don't own it anymore. So I really do like it when some of, and, and I try to be, I, I think, you're probably the same way as you try to be very thoughtful about the things that you do and do not share. Um, like I have a lot of friends on my page that don't necessarily care for my book. Um, but you know, I'll make a point that I put them in a group where it doesn't get shared with them so they don't see it on their page. Um, but again, if I share it with them, they've decided they want to be my friend. So I'm just going to say, Hey, you know, if you don't like it, just, X out of it and get rid of it. That's how you get rid of it. And I think there's Facebook has been clamping down on the things that they allow on Facebook now. So um, like even art pictures have to be blurred out 
if it feels like it might go over the line, which I think is, I think is a bit vague, <laughs> but I think it was what the chief justice that said, I don't know, I can't describe what porn is, but I know it when I see it. And most of the pictures that they have blurred out, I'm thinking not so much porn and not really even nude, but okay, if you want to blur it, whatever. <laughs> Well, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, I mean, I've done a lot of traveling outside of the United States, and I have to admit, as great of a country as we are, and we have, we tend to be really prudish when it comes to sex compared to other countries in the world. And we also tend to equate nudity with sex. Now, there are places like in Scandinavia where people go around naked a lot, a lot more than they do here. Um, you know, saunas and places where it's all nude swimming and, you know, all of this. They're not hung up about nudity and they don't consider being naked sex. We tend to believe that more in this country. You know, if there's a nude picture of somebody, Immediately it gets that sort of, you know, that tingly, woo kind of, you know, emotion <laughs> inspired in people where a lot in other countries it doesn't, you know. And I'm just wondering, you know, where that came from. You know, why, why are we like that? Well, I have a personal theory on it and I'm going to preface that with this is my personal opinion on it. Um, it's not a theory and it, it may not hold any water, but, um, I, I understand exactly what you're talking from. I, I think that I have a unique viewpoint on this because my mother happens to be German um, and my father is an American and my mother, of course, who who spent a lot of time with me growing up, did instill in me a lot of the European type values. And um, so she, she was very open about sexuality. She was very honest about it. And I, I think I'm in that same European sense of view where if I see somebody who's naked, I don't necessarily equate it to porn. Um, so I, 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 this is my personal thought on it is that Europeans do have an, a more open and pro-sex attitude. And I think that it comes from the fact that they start their sex education um, at a much earlier age. In fact, they start it in what we would consider grade school um, in the third and fourth grade, um, way before a child even hits puberty. Um, in addition to that, they don't necessarily teach abstinence, which um, I think is... <laughs> doesn't work, but that's my personal opinion on it. <laughs> then again, I grew up in the South and um, I think it was Blanche from the Golden Girls that said, you know, in the South, it's hot and we have urges. So abstinence doesn't <laughs> necessarily work with us. Um, but they do start it at a much younger age and it's more of a of an intellectual discussion with children. Um, I remember my sex ed class, I think I was 15 and my mother had already had the talk with me, so I kind of already knew all of that. But it was interesting for me because I'm sitting in this class, and of course they separate the boys and the girls, and there was a lot of giggling going on. Yes, I remember I did, that class. Exactly. And it's like everybody's like, hee, it's about sex, which really it was just a bunch of pictures of, of STDs, which they didn't really – and I didn't feel comfortable in the class because – the teacher you could tell was uncomfortable with the subject, first of all. Yeah. Um, so I could only imagine what was being taught in the boys class. Um, but I think, I think that has a lot to do with it is that we have this, we have this sex education that basically isolates girls and isolate boys and they don't get taught the same thing. And I think in Europe, the class is all one class. The girls and the boys are together. It's very comprehensive. It's very intellectual. Yes, there's going to be giggling. It's just the nature of the beast. But that giggling goes away after a while because I think the teachers that actually teach those classes are very comfortable with the subject. They're comfortable with talking about it. I, I mean, to this day, I could walk into where I work which are, you know, is nothing but adults. I'm going to use that term loosely because, you know, <laughs> I love them, but, you know, they're a bunch of geeks, um, which is a lot. I love working there. Um, but I, if, if I said the word penis, they would immediately roll into laughter because I think that's why we see it that way. And I think that 
because of the way that we're brought up, we're we're taught to shun sex. We're we're taught it's bad. It's it's something naughty, and you're supposed to be ashamed that it gets ingrained almost into our into our behavior. And then when we see someone who's just naked, our our mind overcompensates and says it's porn, right? Even though it's not. And I think it's just I think it's the way that we perceive nudity in itself. Um, Europeans. Are, are of course more comfortable with their bodies. And I mean, they have things like nude and topless beaches and it's not a big deal. They've legalized prostitution and they, they've, they've been leading the charge with same sex marriages. They've legalized abortions and they feel that it's important to teach the children about the dangers that can happen with, with early sex and unprotected sex and I think that because they're so open about it, that's why Europeans just, they, they understand, you know what, it's just my body. It's not that big of a deal for them. For us, we've been taught that we're supposed to be ashamed of all the things that our bodies do and that we should, we should feel guilty about something that's very natural. And I'm not sure where that came from. I'm blaming the Puritans. Well, I'll agree with you. And I was going to say, <laughs> I was going to say religion because certainly religion has not helped. Um, when you have, you know, the, the Catholic Church still condemning birth control, they haven't made great strides in 2000 years as far as sexual development or maturity <laughs> in any way, I think. But that's a whole nother show. Um, the other issue that I wanted to bring up was, since we're talking about sex, do you think that people in general, and let's just use Americans because that's who we are, are typically something, sex is something that people do a lot of thinking about, but are really still afraid to talk about it? I mean, do you think we've progressed at all from Kinsey's reports in terms of our kind of acceptance of sex or our tolerance of it, if you will? Or are we still kind of, like you said, you know, somebody says penis and we still giggle? I, I think that, um, I think the doors are open. And um, I think that society as a whole is open to discussing topics that affect a large group of people. Um, and the my basis for that is, is that same sex marriage has come out out of the closet right. and pun was totally intended on that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> the truth of the matter is, is I agree with you. I think a real, I think religion has had a lot to do with the way that we view sex and, um, and I'm not knocking religion. I really am not. I think that people should have a personal relationship with whatever religion they believe. Um, but I don't think that it should override our minds. And I think that that's where we lose a lot of the connection is, is that we're smart, intelligent people, but for some reason we're allowing that spirit to drive our intellect. And it needs to be the other way around. We need to, we need to be smart about who we are. We need to accept ourselves for who we are. We need to stop pointing blame at other people. It's, you know, just because two men want to get married, guess what? It does not ruin the world. Got news for you. And, and it doesn't bother me because guess what? If it's not in my bed, it's, it doesn't affect me. It really has nothing to do with me. It's about two people wanting to be happy and wanting to be recognized for the relationship that they have. So just like you wouldn't, you wouldn't take that away from a mother and a child, why would you take it away from two people who love each other? There is so much hate in this world. We need more love. We need to start looking to understanding instead of trying to find reasons why we can't accept these things. And yes, there are going to be people in this world who are, they're, they're just hateful and they just want to not accept it. That's perfectly fine. Those people need to keep their mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree with you on that. Well, the, the thing about same-sex marriage is that even now, um, there's very little news about it. I mean, you, as soon as the Supreme Court ruled, you had a few of those stragglers like, oh, what's her face, Kim Davis. You go on Yahoo or you go on any of the sites now, there's nothing. You know, it's, it's exactly. really faded into the background because I think people have realized that, you know, if my gay neighbor decides he wants to get married, the only way I'm ever going to know about it is if I'm invited to the wedding. Other than that, I'm not going to know. You know, exactly. it makes no difference. And I think it's 
it's more about love than it is anything else. It's like, you know, let people be happy. Well, and also for the marriage standpoint, it was, it really was a discrimination of, of rights because there was so many different rights that people had once they became married from government pensions to medicare to living wills to children and all kinds of things i mean there was i saw a report that there were over uh, 1200 uh different rights granted to people when they changed their legal status from single to married and all of those 1,200 rights were things that, that gay couples were not entitled to. Exactly. And I, I look at it this way. You know what? If somebody has the fortitude to be in a relationship, a long-term relationship, and that they want to celebrate it with whatever ceremony they want to celebrate it with, and they want to say that I am the same as, as a married couple, a man and a woman, Two women, two men, it doesn't make a difference. Again, if it's not in my bed, it doesn't affect me. And I'm like you. If it, the only way I'm going to know about it is if they invite me to the wedding. And personally, I like gay weddings better. <laughs> well, I think the music's better anyways. Absolutely. And seriously, better food. Much better food. <laughs> uh, one of the other questions on your, your list here, it says, uh, sex sells, but does it really and why? Now, what do you mean by that? <laughs> oh, that's an interesting one. Um, the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of people make the assumption that sex sells. And the truth is, is that it doesn't. It really does not sell as much as you think it does. Um, we have this underlying pre-programmed pre disposition to respond to sexual imagery. Um, and it's so strong that advertisers for the past hundred years have been using it. Oh, yeah. I, I think, I think the best example of it, and, and I hate to pick on them, is Carl's Jr. Carl's Those are the Jr. most overtly sexual ads I have ever seen in my life. Okay. I don't I, think I've seen a Carl's Jr. ad recently. Um, I was yeah, going to say the motor, Carl's the motor Jr. shows, the auto shows where they have the, uh, the girls in bikinis. You know, Absolutely. lounging across the brand new Ford Taurus or something. I mean, what has that got to do with selling a car? You know? It has nothing to do with it. And the thing is, is that anybody knows that if you want your brand to be instantly recognized, that the quickest way to accomplish that or to get a response is to strip down or make a suggestive pose or comment. The problem is, is that we have been deluged with this sexual imagery that we have this age of selfishness and shallowness and these selfies that come over substance and personality. And it's to the point where we have this definition of perfection. It's marked by cosmetic surgery, eating disorders, and Photoshop. Um, but science doesn't lie because sexy ads really don't help brand recall. Just like you said, you, you, you haven't seen a Carl's Jr. ad in a while. I bet you $5 you probably saw one the last time you watched television. You just don't remember it because the imagery is the same in every single commercial. It's just like the beer commercials where they all started using the pretty girls to sell their beer. We couldn't remember the brand, but we knew what they were selling. It was some kind of beer. We just didn't know which brand it was. We couldn't care less. And they actually did a study on the Super Bowl ads, not the most recent one, but this was from last year. And um, on the Super Bowl ads, 30% of the ads that contained sexy images or had a double meaning or double entendres in them were rated far lower in brand recognition, the more family friendly. The truth of the matter is, is if you've got five ads, and let's just say they're all for cars, and four of those ads feature sex imagery in them, you're not going to remember what brand it is when it comes time to buy the car. That last one that maybe is fam family friendly or funny and focuses on something new is the one that you remember. You say, oh, you know what? I really liked that Volkswagen ad because it had the little kid that had the Darth Vader mask. It was really funny. Right. That's what you remember. You don't remember the really hot model driving around in the Audi or the really pretty, uh, the handsome man that was driving the Jaguar. You don't remember those. You remember the kid in the Volkswagen because it was so hilarious because it had a different imagery and it was more family friendly. That was what you, that's what you responded to. 
even though advertisers seem to think that the only thing that we respond to is sex. The truth is, it doesn't sell. Not as much as you think it does. I suppose it sells if that's what you're selling. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> if you're selling sex, trust me, then it sells. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if your product just happens to be a marital aid, and we'll put that in quotations, right. then yes, you're going to need to use some sexual imagery to get that one out there. But I agree with you. I mean, there's no point to having a pretty girl, you know, selling tomato sauce. I just don't see that as being, you know, any kind of a connection that anyone's going to make in their brain. You know, oh... When I go to the supermarket, I'm going to buy the tomato sauce that the hot chick was holding up the can. You know, that just doesn't seem like it would make a connection in anyone's brain that they and would it remember doesn't. that. And the know. truth is, is that in, in, in all of our brains, not just men's brains, because I know a lot of women out there are going to say, oh, it's just the men that don't remember the brand. It's not true. The truth is, is that sexual imagery overrides your brain. And the only thing you can think of is the sexual image. So you you don't see anything else. It's it's kind of like the old joke on the uh, the pretty girl in the picture that you know there's there's like a there's a tree behind it and they say oh there's a tree in that picture because your your mind is focused so much on that sex that you forget to look behind it and I think advertisers are starting to get the picture that sex isn't selling as much as it was before. I think when it was new and fresh because it was a new idea people responded to it but now we've been so overcome by those images that they just don't sell as much as they used to and i think that's why you see a lot of advertisers are now moving to funny they're moving to family friendly and they're actually starting to give us reasons of why we should buy the products there was something instead of the sex there was something that just popped into my head um about sexual uh, using sexual images and things in advertising. If uh, When I was a little kid, I used to travel with my father a lot. And we used to fly on Pan Am back in the day, back in the late 60s and early 70s. Pan Am had a very strict policy about their flight attendants, which they called stewardesses in those days, that they had to be young and they had to be beautiful and they had to be smart and they had to be all these different things. And when they put the ads out in magazines and things, they were always the most beautiful women you could ever imagine, one from each country in the world, right? There was a definite market that they were trying to obtain with that because men were traveling. It was, it was primarily men in those days that were business travelers. You know, now, you couldn't get away with that because you would have people screaming that it was, um, you know, sexual discrimination. I mean, they, they told these women right down to their underwear what they were allowed to wear and what kind of lipstick they could use. Uh, it was unbelievable. I mean, not only in the advertising, but in their actual day-to-day -day job. They were so regulated because they had to keep up this image, this sort of glamorous image. And I'm really wondering if that, in fact, did sell more plane tickets or not. You know, hey, we're going to fly on Pan Am because they have the hottest stewardesses in the market. I don't know. It seems like a good idea. <laughs> well, and I will say this about that, and, 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 and this is a perfect way of putting it, is that Pan Am has been out of business for God knows how long. They've been bought up by other companies and have become other things. But if you stop and think back to the early 60s and the 70s in flight, the first thing that comes to mind is Pan Am. And I don't think that their, their stewardesses or flight attendants were overtly sexual. I think in that particular case, Pan Am was actually building a brand. Because when you looked at these women, yes, they were beautiful. And I, I'm the first one to say it. They were very beautiful women. But they were always very intellectual. They were very approachable. They were clean. They were very stylish. They were, they were forced to wear a specific brand. And I think that that brand came across. And here it is how many years later. And that's what you remember about the ad. And so I think it did work yeah. because you stopped and you thought and you thought, 
they have these lovely women, these beautiful, intelligent women who are going to to be my my flight attendants. They are cultured, they are elegant, and I think that they weren't overtly sexual, which was a big thing for them that they branded their airline perfectly absolutely perfectly because when you stop and you think back you think that was the glamorous time of airline travel you had these beautiful women who were helping you to your seat they would help you they would they would bring you drinks and they were these elegant creatures that you could only see on a pan am flight and i think that that was part of their branding and i think that yes while it was very sexist i agree with you it was it was it was an intelligent way of bringing their brand to the marketplace. They didn't have to use sex to sell their flights. They had a brand and a way of presenting themselves as professional and elegant that put them above other flights. Well, so when well people put, thought, yeah. am I going to fly? Who am I going to fly with? Hmm, Pan Am or am I? I remember Pan Am. Even this many years later, you remember the ads. Sure. They were beautiful. They yeah. were elegant. So I think their branding worked in that particular aspect because they weren't overtly sexual. They were very attractive, and that was the point to it, but it was almost like that subtle seduction to get you to buy. And I think that you responded better to it and you remembered the brand better because it was so very subtle. Well, I think that's well put when you said it's subtle seduction because, sure, none of them were naked. And it wasn't overtly sexual, but it was alluring, maybe would be the word to use. Absolutely. So it, it, it was almost like the siren song calling to you saying, come fly Pan Am. Come, come meet these beautiful creatures that you could, that you get to meet and speak with on a flight. Right. It was almost like right. that, that seductive call to, that you get to be around this beautiful woman for however long you're traveling and you get to meet these beautiful creatures. And there's, I, I think that's why it worked so well because it was so very subtle. The last question I want to ask you, and then we've got to wrap this up. I'm just going to go back to something we started to talk about with uh, social media and how that's changed views and sexual relationships and things. Do you think romance has gone out the window because of Facebook and Twitter and people, you know, text messaging with their thumbs? Do you think real <laughs> romance has just gone out the window now? You know, I, I would hate to say yes because. Yeah, I'm a true romantic at heart. I mean, I, I, I spend my Sunday evenings watching, you know, the AMC and the, the old movie channels because I love those things. I think that they're, I think they're great movies and I think it's a great representation of human relationships the way that they should be. And I think that men and women both probably have to work a little harder to be romantic. And I'm not saying that technology is in the way of romance. Um, I think that there's a way to use technology to to actually create romance. Um, you know, that little text that says, hi, beautiful, how you doing today? Um, can put a spring in someone's step. But I think that we just need to be smarter in the ways that we're engaging with our better halves, so to speak, um, to keep that romance alive. And I think, I think the flower industry will agree with me that romance is not dead. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it's just a little bit, yeah, you're right. It takes a little bit more effort because when you were face to face, it was much easier just with a subtle look or a, a wink or a smile or something like that. You could convey that romantic notion. You know, with an emoji, eh, I think it's lost a little bit of its flavor. But maybe I'm just speaking from, you know, being an old-fashioned kind of guy. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm with you on that one. Uh, the emojis <laughs> don't do it for me either. <laughs> yeah, it, it just doesn't get me excited, you know. But if I'm face-to-face -face with somebody and they give you that kind of nod and that look, then, you know, that'll make my day. An emoji won't do it. Yeah, definitely not. 
I long for those days when we go back to where the guy comes across the smoke filled room and grabs your hand and, and leads you in out to the dance floor and you dance like the foxtrot or you dance a lovely waltz or a tango or something and all that emotion between you but no words have to be said. I'm with you on that one. But you know, unfortunately, if I see one more person twerking, I will have to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> well, no argument from me on that one. And, you know, I think it even started, speaking of dancing, I think it even started back before the technology. I mean, around about the 60s, people stopped holding each other when they danced. I mean, why? Well, I didn't, I didn't get that at all, you know? Well, I think it was part of the sexual revolution was that, you know, the women's movement was just in its infancy. Um, well, it was what the third wave of, of the, the feminist movement. And yeah, I know this is going to be really scary. A woman blaming the feminists. Whew, that's a little scary. <laughs> but yes, I think it had a lot to do with it because we stopped holding each other because women wanted that power and that freedom to choose. And I think that it was that whole we overstepped we overstepped in one direction and now we're sort of coming back. And I, I, I think, I think we go in these trends and the trend I, I I'm waiting for the guy who picks up the trend and starts wearing the fedora again and the lovely suit and is respectful and, and, you know, asks a woman out on a date face to face and, and holds her hand and brings her flowers. And, you know, that's probably why I'm still single coming to think of it. <laughs> well, <laughs> chivalry isn't dead, but it's probably hiding under a rock somewhere. You might find <laughs> Well, if, if you find a nice chivalrous guy that's looking for a girl that's looking for romance, send him my way. <laughs> well, with that, tell everybody where they can find you on the Internet. Give out your, uh, your websites, please. So maybe the guy well, might be listening and uh, who knows, you might get an email tonight. I would love that. I would absolutely love it. And I do love to talk to anybody who would like to chit chat. Um, you can get to most of my social media off my main website, which is www.nicole-delacroix.com. Um, you can get to my Twitter, which is, of course, at Nicole Delacroix and Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, the whole nine yards, any way you want to reach me. And um, of course, there's a whole contact me on my website. I do try to answer emails as quickly as possible and I do answer them myself even though I do have some web minions that put all the lovely graphics together for me because while I do work in IT I don't work in that particular genre I'm not great with the HTML it just kind of confuses me um, but I can I can tell you how the internet works but I, I can't tell you how to build a website <laughs> um, <laughs> But you can reach me on my website, and it does have connections to all my other social media. So if you see me on Twitter, by all means, call me out. If you have a question, please ask it, and I will be more than happy to respond as quickly as I possibly can. Now, your book, Sexual Confessional, Confidential Admissions from Social Media, is that available on Amazon, like an e-book or a hardback book? How is that? Uh, what kind of It is available. It is available on both. It's actually available on all of the major um, bookstores online. Um, of course, Amazon is the mothership, and we all go back to it. Um, of course, it is available on the Create Space store as well as the regular Amazon, and it is available in ebook format. If you have a Nook, it is available on Barnes and Nobles as well. And if you have an iPad, you need to buy a Kindle, but you, you can actually send me an email and I will send you to a um, link that you can download the EPUB version if you, you happen to need that for your iPad. Well, super. Okay, Nicole, thank you so much for being on the show. It was a real treat talking to you, and I think I actually learned a thing or two today, so I feel enlightened. <laughs> Well, thank you for having me, Douglas. As always, it is such a joy to talk to you. And anytime you want me, I'm here. <laughs> okay, take care. Well, that's about all the time we've got for the show today. I want to thank my special guest, Nicole Delacroix. This is Douglas Coleman saying goodbye. <laughs>